uh, talk uh, number three on uh, the question of rituals in art, uh, architecture, design and creative industry. I would like uh, to welcome uh, some great personalities uh, from the creative field and I would like to welcome uh, first uh, Emiko Kasahara who joins us from uh, Tokyo. Uh, Emiko, you, I hope you're still awake and I hope you still have a great Japanese tea or sake on hand. Uh, I'm drinking to keep, tea. <laughs> to keep going. Uh, Emiko, uh, a wonderful artist uh, from Tokyo, but also based uh, part-time in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, Emiko's um, work has been showcased in many, many uh, wonderful exhibitions, uh, major museums such as uh, the Museum of uh, Modern Art in Tokyo, uh, Taich Projects, uh, the Yokohama Triennale, and uh, many more uh, important uh, exhibition venues. And uh, your wonderful work is represented in important collections such as the Berkeley Art Museum or the Yves Klein Foundation and uh, you started out your career studying art uh, at the uh, Tama Art University in Tokyo and we had the pleasure to collaborate already on, uh, on two or three shows uh, and uh, it was exciting and I'm also pleased that uh, you will join us for this year's uh, Vienna Art Week uh, having a work of yours uh, included in our House of Rituals uh, which are We'll get back uh, to later. Then uh, I would like to welcome uh, Elisabeth uh, Um Elisabeth uh, joins us from uh, the Vienna Business Agency. Um, you are in charge and uh, directing the creativity and business uh, department, supporting uh, creative ventures, uh, architecture, design, fashion, uh, and the art market. Uh, very important uh, promotion from the city of Vienna um, and uh, important work. You started out your career originally as a lawyer, but soon switched uh, the field just like me uh, and ventured into the uh, art world uh, working at the MAC. I'm really glad to have you uh, join us uh, this afternoon. Then uh, we have Luca Niketo. Um, hi, Luca. Ciao. Uh, Ciao. Joining us uh, from uh, Stockholm, not from Venice this time. And yeah. uh, Luca, you are currently working on a wonderful design project uh, with uh, Wittmann and uh, you have uh, two your designs to a uh, practice uh, based in Stockholm and Venice uh, working for some amazing uh, companies uh, not only industrial design but uh, uh, like all aspects of design uh, design management and uh, brand design and uh, you started out in Venice at uh, the art university there and uh, early on, you were working at uh, Foscarini, uh, Foscarini, one of my most uh, favorite uh, design companies, lighting companies, and also at uh, Murano, the, the Salviati Murano class uh, factory. We are really glad to have you uh, here tonight and wonder how rituals play an important role uh, in, uh, in uh, design. Then yeah. last but not least, uh, Michael Singanel, uh, graduated, uh, hi Michael, yeah. uh, you graduated uh, in architecture uh, at the Technical University in Graz, uh, uh, both of uh, both our hometown. And, uh, but you not only studied uh, architecture, uh, but also art at the Jan van Eyck Academy in Maastricht. And uh, finally also contemporary history uh, grad uh, with a PhD at the University of Vienna, so very cross-disciplinary. And I wonder how rituals are very different in one discipline uh, next to the other. Um, you are working now as a curator, um, not uh, architect uh, in a classical sense, but curator and initiator of, um, for example, Tracing Spaces, a research institute, and uh, publishing, uh, exhibition making, uh, such as uh, holidays uh, after the fall, seaside architecture in uh, Bulgaria and Croatia, and stop and go, uh, nodes of transformation and transition. And uh, I'm looking forward to learn a, bit, a little bit more about uh, your work in the course of our discussion. We're gonna have a discussion, uh, some questions now for the next uh, 40 minutes, and then for the audience, um, thanks for uh, not opening uh, your mics, uh, uh, dear audience. But uh, you have uh, the, the, the chance to, at any time, to send us some uh, questions uh, through the chat uh, button and we will try to answer 
uh, all of these questions uh, coming in. Uh, hold on one second. I simply have to uh, just uh, close a window here for better acoustics. One second, and then we start. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> As a routine, I wanted to uh, get some fresh air to, uh, before we start. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. Um, I was uh, when we defined uh, this year's theme of uh, Vienna Art Week, uh, living living rituals. Um, this was uh, just in January before COVID uh, hit. But uh, um, uh, actually, uh, through COVID, I think it became very clear how important rituals are and how. Uh, easily uh, routines and uh, and rituals uh, change uh, in these kind of uh, circumstances and uh, there uh, is uh, one philosopher Byung Chul Han who recently published a book about the disappearance uh, of uh, rituals and I wonder if you also uh, on a personal level uh, experience this kind of uh, disappearance of rituals or change also of rit uh, rituals uh, especially uh, during the past couple of uh, months uh, in this kind of uh, pandemic uh, and crisis. And uh, uh, I set this uh, question out uh, to all of you and perhaps uh, Emiko uh, coming from Japan uh, where rituals play a, a very important role. I think uh, when I worked there, it was amazing to uh, see also the difference in rituals. Uh, how did you experience that uh, kind of vanishing uh, or change of uh, rituals uh, recently? Um, obviously, we are not able to see each other physically for um, a month and so in Tokyo. And also, I'm not able to travel, you know, outside of my country because Japan is on the island. So physicality, the contact with the people, enormously decreased, right? Um, but at the same time, this um, made us to think about how to relate that way to relate to people in a different way, just like how we are doing now in the Zoom or you know Google Classroom and stuff like that. But what I would like to really focus is what had changed and what remains. But, at the, but on the bottom is in between those two, something might be reinforced because the things had changed, the things has remained. And then mm -hmm. I think certain kind of um, conservativeness that people started to kind of look over the past, saying that, you know, the beauty of making art, the beauty of touching a material, which is true, but at the same time, somehow reinforce the conservative power politically, aesthetically. And this is something what I really feel like in Japan. People mm -hmm. started or backward. Mm -hmm. could, could you give a, a specific example of the, this kind of uh, tendency uh, 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 of a conservative uh, political effect uh, on, on your society? Okay, um, I teach in art school in Japan, so I can tell that some people started to say that back to all time kind of way of saying. They said, well, joy of creating things, joy of touching materials, joy of actually doing something. And then it, it makes me feel like we forget about like, you know, last couple of decades that we are trying to be, trying to combine those materials and the aesthetics and the political issues and then try to make a concept in between those you know, two different areas. And the people started to kind of, you know, miss a lot about romantic field of art. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, I feel like this is kind of the back to classic time. Okay, okay. Uh, Elizabeth, you are very much working um, with your initiatives uh, in improving uh, this, the city uh, of Vienna and uh, boosting creativity in the city. Uh, how did you experience this last uh, couple of months? And uh, are there some routines that you on a personal level changed or that vanished or, or um, added? Or how did you experience this time? Um, well, on a personal level, I would say I could, can totally uh, rely to hand that I think there was a disappearance of rituals and actually COVID on a very personal level. Um, 
ritualized our daily life. So it's more about daily routines, you know, having breakfast with your family, having lunch, dinner with your family. We did a diary to, um, to help, to hold this um, historic weeks and months um, for ourselves, for this little community um, mm -hmm. we were in the lockdown, like three of us. And um, what affected me most is more the loss of the more traditional rituals. Um, we couldn't uh, take part in a funeral of a very close friend of us. We were not allowed um, to mm -hmm. take part in it. And that was really affecting me um, in the sense, um, how can we live without like celebrating birth, love, adulthood, life, and also um, um, being part uh, when life ends. So this was like kind of my experience uh, throughout COVID. The loss I um, was most concerned about uh, so was the loss of the informal levels. You know, like um, there was, um, in Nico said it, there is no um, reading of body language anymore, no hugging, no embracing, no kissing anymore. And um, also when you were doing Zoom, so like kind of brainstorming, discussing, like exchanging opinions was not possible anymore. So this informal levels of relationships, those undefined spaces. Um, this was something um, I was really concerned about. And, uh, like also this kind of uh, physical community, uh, it's all like a little bit uh, isolated now in social media. Yeah, but, yeah especially, especially talking about the creative process and how creativity um, can take place and, and needs room. Yeah. Um, I thought this was not possible, you know, in a, in a normal meeting or a normal yes. brainstorming, you can also change direction. You can say, let's skip that, let's go into that deep dive here and so on. And, and this was not possible. It was just like very linear. And um, yeah. it, it had the peak when a friend of mine, I had long term cooperation, long year cooperation partner, and we started a Zoom meeting and he was asking me, um, are you recording? And I said, no, why would I do that? But of course, the idea that everything is recorded and can be sent to everywhere, um, it, uh, um, uh, it, Sahindan, it um, preventing you from it. it. It prevents to have this really open discussion, this really open conversation, this really open relationship. And the flow so of ideas. Uh, it's not the loss of the ritual, it's more the loss of the informal, I think, yeah. that constantly mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. And uh, Luca, uh, you are working in, uh, you are living in two countries uh, with very different rituals. Uh, um, how did you experience that uh, kind of uh, change of rituals uh, due to COVID? Well, for me, on I've, a personal uh, level, also. Personal yeah. level changed a lot because um, I normally was I was traveling a lot previously. Uh, I'm, I was taking a plane every week, more or less. And uh, so for me, it's the first time in my entire life that I'm, uh, I'm six months that I'm not staying in my, in my country. So it's a bit, it's a bit strange in that sense. Uh, and, and the most strange thing is that sometimes looks yesterday and other times look like ages ago. The, so the perception of the time really um, make me really think in a different way about also the daily routine. Mm -hmm. And there is days that really looks for me, I don't know, 60 hours and day that I feel that is like five hours. So it's really the perception of the time changed totally. Yeah. And about the rituals, I think uh, from a design designer perspective, for me it was very interesting to see um, the reaction about my community in mm -hmm. general, that in the beginning it looks like that all the designer in the entire planet switched to design mask and, uh, and you know, some kind of protection. Yeah. And for me it was very, uh, strange, honestly, to think about to design for the fear of people. Yeah. And because I truly believe that design should be also to uh, help people in a different way. And also in a positive, in a positive, in a positive way to, okay, our life change, 
we just not need to remember all the time uh, how to protect ourselves. There is other people that tell us how yeah. to do that properly. But in the other hand, we rediscover, in my opinion, a lot of rituals that for many years disappear. Like uh, a lot of people was baking at home. Yeah, so, cook, yeah. cooking. <laughs> And uh, so you read this, I mean, I was asking to my mom recipe of my grandmother because I want to have, you know, to taste something that otherwise I will never taste because I can't travel to Venice. Or, <laughs> and so I, I think in a way, you, you really try to rediscover your own, you know, roots and your origin and... There, there was for sure, if we can talk about the positive side, the fact that people put more attention on these rituals, especially of sharing things, no? To, to really make the people in the front of you or your partner more close to you even more to prepare yeah. something. And, and that part, I mean, is... Um, for me, it was something that I didn't expect in the beginning of this crisis, but then I see that become more and more uh, really a component of our life very strong. Mm -hmm. And uh, like uh, returning to uh, Byung Chul Han about the disappearance of, uh, of uh, rituals in the sense of rituals that give us uh, structure, that provide us uh, with meaning uh, as a community. Uh, do you do you think that uh, COVID uh, just boosted this kind of, uh, for example, the dinner with the family? You Not know, that uh, under normal circumstances happens. Perhaps I don't know uh, when you are working full time and are constantly traveling, happens like once or twice a week uh, on the weekend only. And now you have time to cook and prepare dinner together with the family. Are there some some routines that uh, and rituals that you would keep up uh, after the pandemic or? some of these positive effects that you plan? Mm. Well, I think for me, the most important ritual that I had was I want, once in a while I travel to do my field work and I'm no longer able to do it for a while at least. Particularly what I'm doing now is just something very gerb evolved. You know, I have to go to the railway okay. to put the coins and I have to smash it. This is something what I've been doing for my project for the last few years. So I have to stop my field work. So I have to think about what I thought it was a very interesting part of my art production yeah. is kind of depressed and then postponed. And I have more time to read and meet people online. Um, so it's changed the total, yeah. you know, the schedule. Of Amigo, where... before, uh, before you continue talking about your work, uh, let me just uh, finish our round also with uh, okay. Michael, uh, who hadn't had a voice uh, yet. Uh, Michael, how, how did you cope with uh, rituals in times of COVID? Yeah, many, many aspects have been brought up by the others already. For me, it was uh, strangely not changing too much. It was okay. changing my most important daily ritual, which was going to a cafeteria two times a day. Okay. That's a typical separation ritual from family, you know, being in a neutral place. But I didn't miss anybody there because usually I don't talk to anybody in the cafeteria. If I'm there just in my so-called threshold uh, uh, situation, then I used to go to work, which means meeting many people. So this summer, I was feeling relatively relaxed, not meeting people or only meeting them in these horrible, frustrating conferences. But because of the fear of the Zoom-like conferences, people were better prepared than ever if <laughs> met online. Uh, it shows also uh, with our discussion here, of course, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so it was very funny to me because I saved a lot of time and by accident, I didn't plan to travel abroad because all the projects, uh, for whatever reason, happened to be in Vienna. Okay. So it was a kind of holiday situation to me. I didn't, I didn't organize any trips. I just could go a few miles to the office or to the sites where exhibitions were built up. Mm -hmm. uh, one 
interesting aspect I want to add, the one of cooking was mentioned. I have 50 <laughs> kilogram plus now, and some more elaborate skills about celebrating meals, which we also celebrated in some sort of almost shameful romantic atmosphere. We purchased things for our apartment, which we never thought to do before, because as a creative person, you have to design it yourself, you know, and build it yourself. Mm -hmm. So we really wasted money to support the local, you know, design industry. And what, what, what was missing so far, but probably you also share this experience, my holiday under brackets and the holidays of many of my friends had been a sort of re-traveling of childhood experience in the Austrian Alps. Okay. Um, this I was not alone when I told people, oh yes, this year we're going there and there. Uh, in Styria, you know, the place where you are from, Robert. And many people did that and it turned out that they are totally unexperienced in traveling Austrian Alps because they were so <laughs> experienced in traveling everywhere else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in lack of of kind of, let's say, handbooks, how to travel Styria or how to travel the Austrian Alps. Many of my friends went back to their own or their relatives' school trip experience. <laughs> so they visited exactly the places we had visited when we had been in primary school or high school. Yeah. And I even know from rather prominent persons like Wolfgang Koos, former director of Wien Museum, that he took his son to travel to the masterpieces or let's say the the monuments of Austrian, you know, modernization, Großglockner, mm -hmm. Kaprun, yes, yes, etc. Mm -hmm. Or Minimundos, which is some place where, where you would feel ashamed about some sort of model city in Carinthia. But during this Corona period, uh, joining or let's say bringing together all family members was a great excuse to do some sort of regressive uh, rituals. Okay, great. In holiday planning okay. and practice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, Emiko, uh, you wanted to add something or would, would you like to show us some of your works uh, dealing with uh, rituals? I, I think it shows already the big difference it, between, you know, straightforward walking country like Japan and very enjoyable Central European people. <laughs> nobody really, nobody really tried to go outside of the country. And then also, not many people are expected to have a wonderful holiday here. I think they're very patient and they're really trying to go through it, you know. Very disciplined. And then, yeah, very disciplined from the beginning till now. And it drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I would like to show uh, some of your work. Uh, can we get some slides now? Uh, let's see. Uh, Nina helps us. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, let's start with uh, Emiko. Emiko, uh, yes. This first work, uh, if you continue, yes. Uh, can you talk about uh, briefly about this work and perhaps the second slide? Uh, okay. Um, this is the video work called a setting. I rented one small room in the central Tokyo, very kind of modest apartment. And I had only simple tools, one which is easel and a little miller and uh -huh. then stool. And I asked many women to come there together with their cosmetics or, you know, hair dryers or anything that they would use to prepare for grooming before they go out in the morning. So okay. everybody come to the apartment and they have to take off their makeup or whatever they prepared to, to visit the apartment. And they would be bare face and they sit on the stool and they started to do this morning ritual in front of the mirror. Mm -hmm. And the videotape is set it up slightly above the mirror. So it's actually not the camera eye, but the camera actually focusing on the people who are staring at the mirror and doing a preparation. So mm -hmm. it's very simple, one take, nothing, nothing, be, nothing, um, nothing about, nothing, nothing else yeah. besides that. And then I have 88 people in total um, from 85 years old to 10 years old, I believe. And mm -hmm. they're connected randomly. And it will be 12 hours in total. 
and no yeah. sound at all. And I usually set up in a very kind of secretive way inside of the drawer or uh, the picture Robert just showed was um, in a female's bathroom. Can we return uh, one the slide? The image, images that you show before the image you, you show now. Yes, this, uh, this, this one. one. In the bathroom, the female bathroom, and there's another installation in a male bathroom. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes just above the cafeteria, um, the menu bar, or like, it's always kind of not yes. obvious. Um, the people are looking at something, but if they will look carefully or pay attention, they might realize something has been going on. It meant to be, you know, that way. It meant not to be too obvious because this kind of activity, the women's always are trying to change their self. Not too much, but, you know, something prepared. It's a kind of ritual. They're trying to move from private time to public time. Yeah. And from public to private. I, I think this transitional time is a very important rituals to yeah. manage the society go well. And then I thought it was kind of interesting. What year was this uh, work uh, done? Uh, this was a pre, pre social media no, where the self presentation and uh, the beautification and the idealization and the self improvement <laughs> via social media was not yet there, no? Yeah, it's a whole combination, I guess. I, it depends on the person. I mean... But I mean, this was pre-social media time, no? Uh, this work. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. absolutely before. Um, I don't think there was not even Twitter uh, at yeah. the time. Yeah, mm, uh, interesting. It's like a prelude uh, to this kind of self-beautification uh, uh, that we experience now, uh, mm -hmm. that everyone wants to... Uh, be beautiful on, on uh, Instagram, etc. So, um, very nice work. Can we go to the next uh, piece? Uh, this, uh, I don't know if the audience can see it, but uh, these are offerings no, from churches. Right. Um, this is another project, but I focus on Christianity at around the time. I visited many churches, almost like a tracing history, tracing, you know, the, how the Christianity started from the, you know, Middle East to Europe, to Africa, to Asia, to, you know, the uh, Amer American continent and the stuff. And then trace how it's eluded in the rule of society in general way. Like we live in a very westernized concept, not only in Europe or not in the United States, but also in Asia and Africa and everywhere in the world. So I felt like Christianity actually cultivated the very the basic rule of how the society functions and everybody without question kind of follow the manner. So I started to trace the Christianity to kind of make a slice of the word to show how the thing goes. Mm -hmm. So there's not much personal comment embedded in the work, but I did a tons of field work. I took a picture of only one element at the church, which is offering boxes, mm -hmm. you know, sort of money boxes that yeah. people put the money inside and that will be used for the churches and that will be kind of circulate the word and that will be kind of, you know, fun, support the foundation of the how the rules of the word. Mm -hmm. And then I found also, it's very interesting to think, you know, the money is sort of considered as a dirty thing in, in, in terms of Christianity or in, in terms of any, you know, religious or like a culture meaning, but somehow it is, very the basic of everything at, at this point in the world. So in, in a ritual of offering, people supposed to donate, people supposed to offer, people supposed to donate themselves without expecting, without any expectation of something is coming back to themselves. And then to, to express such a, you know, the beautiful and precious, you know, state, state of mind, they would use very dematerialistic elements called mm -hmm. money. 
So yeah. somehow, <laughs> sort of a black idea and a white idea is kind of combined into gray. So therefore, the boxes are always kind of hidden and the backs are always hidden. And somehow, the money is not supposed to be ex exposed too much. Yeah. And yeah. I like this kind of sort of ritual and, you know, kind of hidden system, whatever. Yeah. And also, you know, functionality is in, in, interesting, but at the same time, shape is always kind of concave and it's something like a passive and something kind of makes me feel like a very female gender. Mm -hmm. Like a sexual orientation. Right. So the many mm -hmm. layers of interest kind of, you know, yeah, I a have. Beautiful, a beautiful, beautiful work also. And I think uh, this one you exhibited already here in Austria, no? at, uh, at an exhibition. Yeah, in a grad. Yeah. Mm. And the last uh, work you wanted to present uh, is uh, this kind of uh, works with tiles. Can you explore that a little bit? Yeah, um, this one is uh, using, it is a paper collage work and using the inner pattern of security envelopes. You know, I have been living in the U.S. for more than 20 years. So I receive always like a bank check, credit card notes, you know, whatever. And yeah. always, they're not supposed to be exposed to the public. So it's always embedded in the em envelopes, in the security envelopes, so-called. And mm -hmm. the security envelopes always use somehow interesting and beautiful patterns. And they're always kind of bluish. Yeah. And it kind of reminds me a uniform of blue and it's kind of you know cooperative blue and it's also kind of you know institutional blue and then yeah. this letter from the bank or the credit card the insurance company is always from public to my private account so something is transforming between public to private no matter i want or not so yeah. i I kind of carry an interesting, you know, fantasy about this bluishness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and then also the tiles is a kind of, you know, clinical thing that you see in the hospitals are supposed to be green. And then also blue tiles, it's a symbols of, you know, Christianity leads to new land like Brazil or like, you know, South America. The people put the blue tiles as a, you know, kind of symbol of, you know, your love reach to the new world. Yeah. So something kind of, you know, layers of those kind of colonization and the private public relationship. And then blue, the color in the tiles is first invented in Asia. Um, ceramics blue, the blue ceramics are from China, travel to the Europe and then travel back to the um, South America and kind of, you know, transform the aesthetics and transform the economy and transform the meaning of authorities and somehow reach to my private account yeah. with banknotes. Okay. <laughs> so I thought it was interesting and I made a series of this and I received these letters, you know, the security envelopes every day. And mm -hmm. then I, at a certain point, because I wanted to collect these blue patterns so mm -hmm. much, I applied for many, many credit cards in the U.S., which is not very difficult in America. So I had like a tons of credit cards just because I wanted to collect in the patterns. Yeah. Of security okay. Envelopes. Okay, great. Okay. Great. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, wonderful. Uh, I think I'm sure we, we get back uh, to you. Uh, maybe now follow. Uh, uh, Luca, would you like to present some work uh, that are uh, referring to rituals? Uh, I think in the design practice, it's, uh, again, uh, rituals are really super important when researching projects, uh, new projects, I guess. Yeah, no, rituals, yeah, I think is, is funny because I selected three works that I did that is somehow related to food or beverage. Yeah, and people think that I'm just looking at that side of my, <laughs> but it's not like that. Yeah, you're talking talk about cooking and <laughs> exactly. I I, I I will be a chef probably now. I'm not. <laughs> no, I think uh, of course the um, the ritual rituals in, in design is also very important. And as I I was telling you before, 
um, sharing a meal or sharing a beverage or something like that is a ritual somehow very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, the project that we are looking at right now is called uh, Suka Baruka and is um, a coffee maker for a uh, filter coffee. And the story is quite interesting because I was traveling in Toronto and um, a, a friend gave me advice to visit this store that is called Mjolk, that means milk in Swedish, that are, is run by two guys, a couple, John um, and Judy, that they love uh, Japanese design and Scandinavian design. So they have a selection of vintage, uh, Japanese things and uh, Scandinavian. So I, I went inside the store and immediately John recognized me and uh, he came to me, we started to talk and then he asked me, I would love to do a, a project together with you. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, I, and we were drinking a coffee and uh, I said, you know, sorry for the coffee, by the way. And and then I say, why we are not working on to do a, a coffee maker? I say, because always when I'm traveling, people try to apologize about the coffee. <laughs> the Italian. Okay. Yeah. And I say, why you need to apologize? The rest of the world is not drinking espresso as we are drinking in Italy. Uh, and most of the people are drinking uh, filter coffee. Mm -hmm. Why not to do a very interesting uh, um, coffee maker that are both mm -hmm. for the um, for that kind of coffee. Mm -hmm. So then I start to think about the idea of the the, the object, and uh, in that moment I was also really into the work of uh, uh, Italian master Ettore Sozzas, not about his job in terms of. Uh, uh, aesthetics, but more about the, um, what you want to say with this job. And, uh, and I was very, very attracted about the, all the analysis and the research that he did around the totems. Yeah. The totems as a represented a sort of uh, object that the people somehow is related to. So, mm -hmm. When I start to thinking about Suka Baruka, this coffee maker, I want to do an object that somehow, when it's not used, is a kind of like a totem yeah. that show that is in a way you respect this object, you are related to this object, also for what is creating for you later on. Yeah. So everything become like vertically, so you can stack. Mm -hmm. all the element that is necessary on this cone yeah and another part that and it's only for two people so you the idea is you put this totem in the middle of the table and there is only two cups so you share with your lover or your wife or whatever in the front of or the person that you want in that moment sharing something mm -hmm. and the so, shape mm -hmm. somehow is also Every time that I'm designing an object, I always try to create, to think about the empathy, not only the function. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the, when I was- the, the empathy, you mean like uh, to create a community in that sense, a totem uh, for the ritual of uh, drinking yes. to get coffee. Mm -hmm. Yes, but also the empathy uh, between the, the relation that there is between the users and the object. And the object. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't, mm, I'm not a designer that are looking only at the function. I think it's very important also for me what the object need to say. Yeah. And um, in this case, uh, the shape of the, let's call it the caraf, is yeah. coming from a character that was part of a, was a used as an advertising for an Italian coffee maker that was called Carmen Sita. Carmen Sita. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and that character was a cone 
white with two eyes somehow and dressed as a Mexican. Don't ask me why, but it was a very funny character. And somehow I always, when I was thinking about coffee, I always have these images about this Carmen Sita. <laughs> so I, I'm glad I, to hear, I'm glad to hear. <laughs> and not Nespresso and not Lavazza. <laughs> Yeah, Carmencita, by the way, I think was Lavazza, the, the, the okay. brand that used the... And uh, can we go to the next uh, slide or two next, a uh, little bit, uh, uh, we have to um, yeah. be this a little bit brief. Is, this one is also uh, a project. It's very archaic, no? Also very archaic in the mm. sense of... Yes, I developed it, uh, it's called Cebuata, and is um, is a, co a cup, a bowl to share in soup. And uh, I designed for a um, company that is based in Suzdal in Russia. And uh, I was very attracted to, the, to the, the possibility to work with the uh, local artisan and yeah. working with his smoking ceramic. And then they are glazing the ceramic with honey. So it was very archaic also process. And that yeah. was very interesting to see how to move a very archaic process in a ritual, but in the same time in a contemporary object. It's very beautiful. And then the last one you wanted to show us? And the third one is uh, <laughs> something very Italian. Um, is uh, a set of knife and stand for the prosciutto, prosciutto crudo, the ham. And uh, was very interesting for me when this company a, pro a producer of prosciutto asked me to design a couple of knives for them yeah. uh, as a gift for the client. And then talking with him, visiting the factory, I discovered how much craftsmanship there is in the producing a prosciutto. And I want to, in a way that all the tools to serve the prosciutto have the same kind of attention and quality. So I work with one of the oldest knife artisan in Italy mm -hmm. uh, that is called Coltelleria Berti in Tuscany and we developed this uh, entire set that um, helped also the company to positioning uh, the, the prosciutto in a kind of gastronomy level Yeah, uh, and we work on the entire also range of uh, uh, labels and uniforms and so it was a project that somehow become 360 degrees yeah, the whole brand uh, design basically. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's also uh, beautiful. It's uh, again very ritualistic uh, in that sense. Um, maybe uh, thank you so much, uh, Luca, to to give us these insights. Uh, Michael, you also have some slides, I think. Uh, if we go back, yes. You want me to talk? Yes, please. Uh, what is Dr. Go? No, uh, notes, of, uh, notes of transformation and transition. No? Yeah. Uh, I, I wanted to come back to my, as you know, with my so-called hybrid biography, I yes. uh, used to work both in the field of science and art, art-based research or research-based art and science. And for me, it was quite interesting that this notion of rites of passage was coined by an anthropologist already in 1908, that is 112 years ago. And he defined this uh, rites of passage as a tool to stabilize every threat to the static social order of a society or of a person in his life career. And therefore I think that the, this uh, notion of the ritual and rites and rites of passage uh, fits very well to traveling of all kind. Mm -hmm. To pilgrimage, of course, to, to traders, transnational trips to the Grand Tour of the aristocrat. In the pre-modern times, people were sent away from their hometown to get adult, you know, uh, to yeah. test themselves and come back if they had stabilized themselves again. Yeah. Uh -huh. And of course, we can also discuss that about the career of a scientist or of an artist, but I want to come to the project we did recently that was investigating uh, the so-called pan-European transport corridors connecting the former east and west of Europe 
where hundreds or thousands or millions of people used to travel every day or weekly yeah. or monthly. And for doing research, we needed to somehow integrate ourselves by purchasing a Ford Transit van. So Transit is the program. Yeah. And with a trailer, which we used as a sort of big drawing board in the field. And on this photograph, you see us lining up at one of the typical th thresholds in the landscape, which is the border station between Bulgaria and Serbia. And if you do not make friends with, your, with the other buddies uh, on the street, you would never ever be able to pass the border station without paying an enormous amount of money for mm -hmm. bribing them. If you become okay. friends of them, and if you know how to make, uh, you know, uh, a fire, how to exchange alcohol and cigarettes, and assimilate into the rituals when waiting at the border, they will introduce you how to pass the border with five euro bribe only, which saves you also probably one or three days waiting in the line. You know, so there, are, there there's this very specific knowledge of all these people on tour. Uh, probably the most impressive persons to us had been the international bus drivers driving from Vienna bus terminal to some little places in so-called Balkan, usually the places where they are from. So they're immigrants bringing uh, uh, commuters from the southeast to Vienna and back. So for us, this was a sort of a project looking into the backstage area of European, uh, of the European wealthy because we all depend on these people who take care of our grandmothers or to fix our things uh, yeah. at very low price. Mm -hmm. and, but this is only one project. And I did, as you know, as I've mentioned, all the projects about tourism, where it's pretty clear uh, why rituals are so important, because otherwise we would have a lot of conflicts with each other. And it had been Urban Goffman in the 50s already who argued that each social interaction between humans needs a kind of stage and a clear situation who is playing with whom so who yeah. wants to interact yeah and this also opens of course the idea of a front stage and the backstage mm -hmm. and later on Schechner who was the most important theoretician for performance art added but the idea of a front stage and the backstage is no more true because today everybody plays theater at the same time and it's up to us to identify who is posing for whom and who is not. So they started as a sort of asymmetrical theater. And I think this is quite interesting with rituals as well. Yeah. We have so many new rituals or the big rituals of old times got smaller and smaller. And they're hardly, we are hardly able to identify them if they do not address us in our language code. Mm -hmm. And could you mm -hmm. show the next, please? Next slide. Okay. Yes. Yeah, this is one of our typical performances, so-called guided tours. In this case, we made a guided tour around a very boring town in Upper Austria, which is characterized by two very special opposing uh, things. One, it's a railway company hub, where almost 80% of the people are relatives to railway workers, all social democrats by birth, and all used to social democratic demonstrations, rituals, meetings, songs, and their own Bibles. And on the other hand side, there is an important pilgrimage church in the same place. There's also a very strong uh, Catholic wing in the city. And so we call this project Don Camillo and Pepone. And we built this strange vehicle, which we call a kind of funeral procession or Tatlin kind of monument which mm -hmm. is rather shabby, but it can be unfolded. It can speak to the people. It, can, it has a, a kind of flagpole that can be lifted and set down. And it has some sort of uh, ritual objects for people to play with. And the mm -hmm. people are guided around with headphones throughout the city. And as you all know, if you're guided by a guide with a microphone who tells, gives you the commands into the headphone, you're pretty much alone with the voices in your headphone and somehow kind of alienated of the others, but part of a group. And you feel a bit of ashamed of following all the commands 
all the stupid commands in this kind of theater performance. But people who pay for a theater performance are used to get commanded, you know. So for in the field of fine arts, this would be a bit out of taste, but in the field of theater, this is quite normal. And so these people, they were all immediately getting into the rules of the game because they know them either because they're brought up Catholic or they brought up social democratic, because they exactly know how this works and that you have to follow the leader because there's something you will be given back at the end, some mm -hmm. sort of uh, final gift. And here we're passing by some, you know, typical suburban garden where the, where, where the voiceover voice tells them some absurd stories mm -hmm. about the objects on display. Mm -hmm. Next. Right, right. Great. Ne uh, next slide. Yeah, another book. Okay. And this is one of the most recent things. So artistically, this is not of a very big value. It's part of the current project called Fish Stories in Vienna. Actually, we have our project space nearby this former railway station. And the many fishes we produced, they're all the same design, not very exciting. But all these fishes are somehow presented, like many people know, from a graveyard for the unknown soldier. So this is pretty much bad taste from one point of view. But these fishes are marking the place where they once lived, because exactly where the railway tracks are had been a former arm of the River Danube with the thousands and hundreds of thousands of fishes, which were all killed uh, for the modernization of Vienna to build a railway station like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, although this looks rather silly and it's obvious the comic style fish reproduced 100 times, uh, people who visit the place automatically get into some sort of solemn atmosphere and immediately show some, again, like Luciana said before, empathy. Yeah. They ask us for the fish and why the fish had to die. And mm -hmm. nobody laughs, you know. Also, this looks really rather unserious. The, yeah. people, the people get totally, get emotionally touched by, yeah. by these associations of a graveyard mm -hmm. and immediately want to know about the species that suffered. And uh, for us, it's just, uh, and was just a, let's say, a strategy to mark and a specific aspect of the history of the place, which will be uh, torn down and uh, rebuilt as a new development mm -hmm. uh, nice. in the city. A, a beautiful project also. Uh, I think there's more information on, uh, on your website on, on that uh, current yeah. or recent uh, project. Uh, and uh, I think uh, our audience uh, should visit on, uh, all your websites uh, for further information. Uh, Elisabeth, uh, the last slide of Michael was, uh, touching um, uh, urbanization and uh, the city um, as, a, as an environment for rituals. Um, in your work, are there some examples that you would like to point out uh, that uh, helped uh, sort of uh, improve our situation, especially uh, during lockdown when, uh, you know, parks were closed and uh, um, cafes were closed uh, that help us to build community, to interact, uh, to, to, to experience rituals that again uh, help us in communicating with each other. Are there in your uh, activities, uh, in city promotion and uh, promoting uh, designers, creatives, uh, are there some examples that recently you were, you are proud of uh, supporting? First, uh, um, the, the best experience I had through COVID was um, that like the hierarchy between like the city of Vienna, you know, um, and who gives us the budget for our programs and all the proponents were super flat. So you could do programs within one day. And we started an ideas competition starting at half past uh, seven in the morning doing the concept and we had the budget by four in the afternoon to support the creative scene in Vienna. So this was like kind of best practice, I think. And, like a political uh, urgency that was... Uh, that was helping uh, us to to get more actionistic in a way um, and, and, and um, to get, uh, get moving. 
Um, and this um, ideas competition raised questions like how can we strengthen solidarity in the city? How can we have an open city again? Where do we have concert culture? Where, where should that take place? New ways of communication, new ways of cooperation, new business models, um, the future of work. And um, it was super surprising for me because we had 700 submissions and surprising in the sense that I thought this is a time where everybody is taken by his own or her own problems, which was not the case. Everybody was really willing to get engaged, to participate, and we had like 240 projects that really can move the city. Um, well, of course, the main topic, and, and Michael Zinanel um, also showed it now, was the public space, and it became so evident how important the public space was and will be for us and new ideas how we can meet how we can have concerts and culture uh, in the future so um, many pro uh, many projects dealing with that um, but also like you know the clubs were shut down locked down so um, there was this beautiful project united we stream where the clubs if you can't go to the club uh, the concert come to your um, to your home, to your living room, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well with concerts uh, and, and the cinema. If you can't go to the cinema, um, let the cinema come to your home and project the, the, the movies in your courtyard. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. um, I have one last uh, round before we open for some questions, if there are. Um, I, I check, for example, uh, many creators have uh, um, very specific uh, rituals to basically help them to be creative in the first place. And uh, for example, I just uh, learned that Brian Eno, he's drawing cards uh, from time to time with instructions like do something boring or breathe deeper or follow your worst impulse. Or for example, uh, Karl Lagerfeld, he, did, he had a super structured uh, day mm -hmm. entering office only at 5 uh, p.m. in the afternoon, staying until 8 and then uh, returning to his, uh, his studio. Uh, or for example, uh, Henri Toulouse-Lautrec, uh, he prepared a special drink uh, for um, like an aperitivo before then venturing out into the uh, Paris nightlife uh, to start drawing and painting uh, his uh, famous uh, works. Do you in your, your work have, uh, follow some routines that you would really miss uh, or that for example, you, you start out the day with um, your design work, your artistic work, your, um, is that, uh, your, your concepts uh, that help you uh, really boost your energy, your creative energy? Something comes up your mind? Coffee. Like, like <laughs> I, I, Michael, you are going to the coffee house twice yeah. a day. Not only. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think that, it, that in, there was this nice exhibition by Elke Grassen in Architecture Center Vienna about how architects work. And there are many of them having rather childish, you know, play-like situations to, 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 somehow, to somehow boost a kind of brainstorming session. Because one of the major problems in some large offices is that, that there is an implicit hierarchy between the senior designers and the younger ones. And it's rather difficult to encourage the younger ones to come up with their ideas in front of the, you know, old buddies. And as we know that uh, Kop Himmelblau for a long time had been proudly presenting themselves as starting to play Mikado before any design project, you know, is, is really started. So they, they're playing Mikado and, and, and then, they, then they have to make um, another model or drawings of the, of the sticks laying on the ground or laying on the table of the, of the mm -hmm. architects. In, in my case, it's easier because uh, I don't have any idea what to do if I don't have a space where to do it. So let's say that's the legacy of having studied architecture for endless time. And so therefore I need to walk around the area or around the space and inhabit the space for quite a long time, daydreaming and even, which my wife is very jealous about, even dreaming during night about what can be done. <laughs> so I can somehow concentrate without any special mediation exercise that instead of watching TV or instead of reading a book or instead of doing anything else, that I just lay down and think about 
what could be done in the next project. And definitely, I usually I fall asleep and when I get awake again, I have forgotten almost everything. But if something, you know, had stayed in my mind, it's worth to follow this. You got the solution. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's not the solution, but it's, it's you know, it's a, it's a direction yeah. uh, where, okay. where I would go to. This is, of course, uh, lacking all scientific, you know, legitimation. But, but, it, but it helps because very often, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the creative field, it's, you're very unhappy if you would, most of my friends, I would argue, would feel very unhappy if they have a solution within a second, which is a very appropriate, which is, let's say, the standard solution. Mm -hmm. You know, what the handbook would tell you would come up within a second and then you desperately try to transgress uh, by, I think, by specific rituals of, uh, that encourage you to, the, to do this transgression. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Emika, do you have a certain routine that you would follow before uh, starting the workout on the, your projects? Uh... Um, the, the, during the pandemic time or before? Well, in general. In general in, or what well, the... in, in general, definitely um, I need to travel. I need to kind of go middle of nowhere to think or to make my mind kind of blank. So this is yeah. a kind of very important ritual that I've been doing the years and years, and now I have to kind of stop it. So I mm -hmm. kind of, you know, agree with um, uh, the other people said, I try to kind of daydream. I try to kind of imagine, I try to kind of, you know, close my eyes and think about. And then also I feel like uh, I started to talk with the people more as a matter of fact, because I, I, I had more chance to speak with the people on online or Zoom conversation. And then I was able to touch, I was able to hug, I was able to kind of, you know, breathe the same air together with the friends or the people I wanted to talk to. So <laughs> that kind of assimilated my way of understanding, you know, to of those people. But now we cannot do that much. So I, I think I try to get other type of information that kind of helps me up a little bit. Um, okay. And I, I drink more tea, I guess. <laughs> you drink more tea, okay. And uh, Luca, uh, how about you? Uh, do you have a so, uh, Italian espresso to keep your creative mind uh, running? Uh, or any other routine? Coffee, coffee for sure. Let's say that uh, I really enjoy, uh, I put some rules that from 8 until 11.30 in the morning. I don't want to have Zoom call or phone call, n nothing. I just need to have three hours for me to, to sketch, to draw, to read. Uh, that, I think. Mm -hmm. that for me is very precious time because as I said before, I, I think uh, I really appreciate this situation because I'm spending more time in my studio uh, than before. Yeah. Before my, my job become really, uh, I mean, as I told you, I was always in a plane and I feel always super frustrated that I was not able to go deeply into the, pro into the project. Mm -hmm. Now I think I have, I somehow had the opportunity to take back that part of my job and I really enjoy it. Yeah, like a, a cell, uh, it's like solitude and uh, self isolation in a way, you know. Um, um, yeah, and and uh, lack of distraction. Uh, distraction, I mean. Before I was always multitasking, and I'm not yeah. very good in multitasking, honestly. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> Elizabeth, do you follow any routines? Uh, I, I'm, I'm with a, yeah, I'm I'm with Emiko here. I'm I'm a, I'm a big uh, daydreamer. But okay. it, it, it was funny what came to my mind now because it's like um, if you don't, if you're not able to to make any experiences, and and the time of COVID was a time where we couldn't experience. Um, it it was evident we, that we are we started to live of our archives much more than before. You know, like all yeah. the visual words were full of docs and photos from the past. Okay, so um, this was something um, that came to mind. So I, I fear a bit this world, of course, this time without 
the possibility to make experiences. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we are already over time. Uh, it's uh, past uh, six o'clock. I'm not sure if there are any questions, if uh, our audience uh, has any questions. If not, um, if not, I would like to thank you uh, for joining our discussion. Uh, I wish you uh, uh, many, many nice uh, rituals uh, to, uh, to further <laughs> create your wonderful work, uh, really. Uh, I also would like to uh, thank our audience uh, for joining us. Uh, thanks so much. And of course, uh, our Art Week team. I also would like to invite you to join us uh, for Vienna Art Week. We are starting uh, with the theme of living rituals uh, on the 13th of uh, November. Uh, we're gonna have uh, some uh, wonderful artists uh, and their routines in their studios, uh, more than 100 uh, artists that uh, are presenting their work. And also as a new um, highlight, I would say, we are opening a house of rituals, uh, an abandoned house in, uh, in the outskirts of Vienna that uh, will present works, uh, for example, by Emiko, uh, by Mika, uh, Michael, Elisabeth Samsonov, uh, Scott Clifford Evans, and, uh, and uh, Evalia Klink, and uh, some uh, many more artists that uh, work with the theme of rituals in very different uh, aspects. And uh, I would like to, I would like to uh, end uh, our discussion with a, with a nice little uh, quote uh, by Georges Balanchine, the dancer, and uh, he preferred to wash his laundry himself. And he said uh, once, uh, he's, he feels the most creative when he is ironing. So <laughs> that, was, uh, that was his-, his uh, Send his him routine. over. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, best wishes from Vienna and uh, keep, uh, keep healthy and sane. And uh, see you hopefully during Vienna Art Week in November. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Nice Bye. to see you. Nice to see you.